Hello, Mr. Porson. You're most welcome to our second program on baptism. Yeah. We're so glad to have you here a second time to discuss about this very vital subject. Mm -hmm. Last time uh, we looked at your personal history and the fact that you had been baptized as a baby, but then you came to change your mind. Yeah. And we also talked about the New Testament requirements of baptism. Mm -hmm. And then we touched a little bit of the history of infant baptism. And now I would like to jump into directly into that subject and ask you, uh, can the baptism of babies be supported by scripture? Before we get into that very big question, I'd like to add just a little about the history. Okay. Um, those who baptize babies freely admit that their primary argument for doing it comes from history rather than scripture. It goes back so far, it goes right back to the second century. But I'd just like to point out that it was also at that time that baptism did another unusual thing. Baptism was not only brought down to the birth of a baby, it was brought forward to the death of someone. And in the second century I had these two unusual developments either baptizing someone at birth or postponing it until death. Mm. And I think wrong thinking lay behind both these developments. The deathbed conversion idea was that you mustn't sin after baptism or it undid the whole thing. Mm. So you waited until the last moment of life so that you wouldn't sin again and then you got baptized. That happened to Constantine in a later century. So most baby baptizers, and I much prefer that term to infant, because mm. an infant covers a bit later as well. Mm. Baby baptizers, their main argument is from history. But it would be lovely if they could find an argument from scripture as well. That would immensely strengthen their case. I, I, I just still want to go back on the second century. So you're saying that already, uh, as early as in the second century, you're saying some foreign elements came to the church and we mm. cannot be, uh, just take uh, their example us and, and uh, justify No, there were things. a number of big changes during the period of what we call the church fathers, mm. which is the earliest centuries. Um, for example, the, the biggest change was from many bishops in one church to many churches to one bishop and that was a huge change mm -hmm. in structure. The church became more hierarchical and more of a pyramid structure mm -hmm. and there were many developments around that time okay. which I feel are contrary to scripture uh, and infant baptism was one of them. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, since then of course there has been a strong desire to find biblical basis for it as well because for all Christians the Bible has a unique authority mm. and if you could find baby baptism somewhere in scripture that would of course settle it for many. Mm. And so we must look at some of the scriptures that uh, have been thought to be used. Now bear in mind that in those earliest times of the church they didn't have the full New Testament. They had the verbal teaching of the apostles' doctrine, but it hadn't been written down yet. So the Bible of the early church was the Old Testament. Mm. That was the scripture as far as they were concerned. And of course, whenever the New Testament apostles say according to scripture, they're referring to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the covenants that God made were with a whole nation, a whole people, including the children, including the babies. Mm. Uh, because his covenants were made with Israel. Uh, not with Israelis, but with Israel. They were not made with individual Jews, but with the whole nation, mm. which included babies. And so the covenant promises that God made in the Old Testament included babies, and that's true. And so the first argument from scripture that was used to justify baby baptism was in the old covenant they circumcise babies, mm. in the new covenant we baptize babies. Mm. And that there is an exact parallel mm. between circumcision in the old 
and baptism in the new. And that argument is still used, uh, especially since there is one verse in the New Testament that uses the word circumcise and the word baptize together. Yeah. Colossians 2 verse 11. That's right. And on that one verse alone, people have said, there you see, baptism and circumcision are the same thing or much the same. One is the equivalent of the other, or the word usually used is parallel. Mm. But in fact, when you read that verse carefully, it's just the opposite. How come? Paul, Paul is saying it is not circumcision of the flesh. Yeah. That it's a circumcision inside, not outside the body. <laughs> it's a circumcision of the heart that takes away the old flesh or the old nature that that's the circumcision in Christ. That's what he's talking about. Mm. And amazingly, even in the Old Testament, the prophets said, you've got circumcision of the body, but you need circumcision of the heart. Mm. You need something cut out of your heart. Mm. Uh, and so even the Old Testament talked about a different kind of circumcision. And Colossians 2.11 talks about baptism in the context of that different kind of circumcision okay. that is inward, not outward. Okay. So that verse does not support a parallel. But one other point I need to make on that one is that the biggest controversy in the New Testament was over circumcision. Yes. Whether Gentile believers who were not Jews coming to believe in a Jewish Messiah should be circumcised. And Paul fought tooth and nail against the idea mm. that Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised. And the reason he taught it was this, he said, if you submit to that, you are coming under and putting yourself under all the laws of Moses. You'll have to keep the lot. Mm. If you become a Jew, <laughs> you've got to keep the Jewish laws. And so he fought for our freedom from circumcision. And in the whole controversy, which was the subject of the first Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, and the subject of the whole of Paul's letter of Galatians, in the whole argument, no one thought of saying, we don't need circumcision because we have baptism. Mm. Nobody thought of making a parallel between <laughs> the two, which would have settled all the argument, mm. which to me shows that they never thought of circumcision and baptism yeah. in the same light at all. Now that was the argument for baby baptism from the yeah. Old Testament. Okay. But there have been many attempts in the New Testament to find yeah. justification. Now all baby baptizers admit freely that there is no specific mention of baby baptism in the New Testament. Mm. There is no verse that says mm. this person and their baby were baptized. Mm. Nor is there a single command in the New Testament that specifically says baptize your babies. Mm. Now that's freely admitted. But it's what we call an argument from silence, which means to argue from what the Bible doesn't <laughs> say rather than what the Bible does say. And an argument from silence cuts both ways. It doesn't say baptize uh, babies, but that doesn't imply that you don't yeah. do it. It doesn't say a baby was baptized, so how do you know a baby wasn't? You see, the, an argument from silence mm. is a very tricky thing, and you better not to use it, actually. So I don't use it. I argue from what the Bible does say. Yeah. And so there are a number of uh, ways in which baby baptizers uh, quote certain New Testament scriptures, That's right. and uh, they are these. One is what Jesus said about children mm -hmm. and what he did with children. Yes. Suffer the little children to come to me. Mm -hmm. And he took them in his arms and blessed them. And unless you become as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. I want to point out that child is not baby. He didn't say, unless you become like a little baby, you can't enter the mm. kingdom, except you become a, a child. And that's a big difference. A child is conscious. Mm. A child can make decisions. A child can do things. 
And when it says they brought children to Jesus and the disciples said, no, no, he hasn't time for children. And Jesus said, just a minute, let the children come. It doesn't say mothers carried babies. It says fathers brought children. Everybody thinks it was mothers who brought them, but it wasn't, right. it says yeah. fathers. It's masculine. Mm -hmm. And these fathers brought children to Jesus for him to bless them. And Jesus blessed them. And Jesus can bless children. <laughs> and I asked him to bless my children. What he didn't do was baptize them. Mm. And he didn't say to the disciples, baptize them. For if such is the kingdom of God, he blessed them, didn't baptize them. Uh, and they were children, not babies. So to use those scriptures to support baby baptism is really going beyond what they say. What but probably the most, sorry, I'm uh, so I was just about to say that uh, what about uh, when the Bible talks about uh, in the Acts, especially households being baptized, yes. and I understand they were quite large those days. Weren't there any babies that were baptized? And it says that, you know, the household was baptized. That's so. right. Well, there are two things to be said about that. There were five households that were baptized. Mm. I've baptized households. Really? <laughs> the word household does not mean family. Okay. It's a different word. It's a much bigger word than our family. We think mm. of a family as father, mother, two children, mm. a dog and the common cold. That's what we think of <laughs> as a family. Right. We have a very small notion of family anyway. But household includes servants, mm. slaves. Yeah. It means literally everybody living under one roof. And uh, when we fill in forms for the population census in Britain, the word household is used. They want to know everybody in the household, mm. which doesn't mean necessarily relatives. It could be friends living or a, a lodger living. And in those days, of course, it included slaves. Mm. Now that's the first thing. It doesn't say families were baptized, it says households were. Yes. Secondly, when you study it carefully, you find that certain other things are said about the household, okay. as well as the fact that they were all baptized. <coughs> okay. For example, with the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, that's one example, read that carefully, and it said, Paul spoke the word to him and all the others in his house, mm. which means that Paul could preach the gospel to everybody in that household. Mm. When you study the other situation, you find the same thing. Lydia, a businesswoman, may well not have been married at all, but she had staff, she had servants, and in fact it happened in a prayer meeting by the riverside of women. Doesn't say children either. Mm. There was a prayer meeting, a group of women met to pray, and Paul baptized them at the riverside. <laughs> right there. Those, yes, right, <laughs> you read it. And oh. they were uh, all praying, mm. you see. So it, again in Cornelius, the same thing happens. Uh, Peter was preaching, and the Holy Spirit came on all of them in his household. It yeah. says that all that were listening were filled with the Spirit, and then Peter said, how can we forbid water for these who have received the Spirit? So only the ones who received the Spirit were baptized. Were baptized. Right. Okay. So when you study, it's only a superficial appeal that says households were baptized, so mm. we should. Uh, everybody under one roof heard the word, and this is to go back to something I said earlier, Hearing the gospel and receiving it is necessary before baptism. Mm. And in the case of these households, that necessity was there. Yeah. So they were conscious people able to hear and receive what Paul was saying. Yes. And he then baptized them and Peter did the same after they'd heard the message and received okay. it. And in Cornelius' case, after they'd received the Holy Spirit as well. So there were these... Uh, preliminary conditions fulfilled okay. before they baptized households. Yes. And I've had a number of lovely baptisms of households where everybody in one house has become Christian and I've baptized a lot. Yeah. So I believe in household baptism. <laughs> That's good. 
But there's another text in Acts that needs to be looked at. Yeah. On the day of Pentecost, after Peter preached, and the people were so uh, feeling their guilt, they said, what shall we do? Um, or what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit, because the promise is to you and to your children. Yes. Now that's been picked up by many baby baptizers, mm. and said, well, there we are, and to your children. Yes. Well, they don't quote the rest of the verse, unfortunately. <laughs> it immediately adds, as many as the Lord calls. Okay. So, your children, and by the way, the promise isn't baptism, it's baptism in the Holy Spirit that is the promise. Okay. And the, that promise of receiving the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children as many as the Lord calls. So they have to be children who hear the call. And not only that, but Peter has already said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm. And therefore, the word children there must be qualified by two calls. As many as the Lord calls, and as many as call on him. Mm. Now all your children whom the Lord calls and who call on him <laughs> will be saved and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Once again, when you don't just quote a verse out of context, but look into it yes. carefully, it doesn't actually say what people want it to say. That's right. So we've got the Old Testament covenant idea that babies are included. They were included, Abraham and his children and his babies, they were all included. Babies mm. were circumcised. Mm. But the new covenant, which is what we're under mm. in the New Testament, the new covenant is intensely individualistic. That comes as a surprise to some people. Mm. Uh, the old covenants were corporate. They were to a nation, mm. to everybody within it. Mm. The new covenant is very definitely addressed to individuals. In Jeremiah 31, where it's first announced, it says, and each will know me, <laughs> firsthand, mm. each. And throughout the New Testament, the the teaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is addressed to individuals, not families. Mm. For example, um, well, I've already quoted one. Listen to this. When they said, Peter, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, each one of you. And that's the appeal of the gospel. Mm. On the day of judgment, we can answer for no one but ourselves. Yes. Not our family, not our children, not our parents. On the day of judgment, we stand before God by ourselves. Mm. And in the day of salvation, we stand for ourselves. Each one is responsible for the relationship to God. It's a very individual thing, and uh, all evangelists appeal to individuals, each one, to repent and believe. And this is, this is the emphasis right through the new covenant. The new covenant is not made with families. It's not made with nations. It's made with each creature that God has made. And each person must respond for themselves and no one else. Mm. You can't make your children Christian. Mm. I wish you could. You can't do it. They must come to Christ for themselves. You can't, in fact, be responsible for anyone else before God. Mm. You can do everything you can mm. to help someone to be saved, but I can't decide that someone else should be saved, even my own children. But um, I've heard many times uh, people who teach infant baptism uh, say that a baby, it's, it's, it is possible for a baby to believe. And in a sense, who, it, who is to say that a baby couldn't believe? So is well, there any scriptural proof that a baby yeah. couldn't believe? It's interesting that Martin Luther defended infant baptism by saying, who can prove that a baby can't believe? Mm. Well, I just want to answer that by saying, who can prove a baby can? <laughs> but in the New Testament, believing is not an instinctive trust. Mm. It is a mental response as well as 
the response of the heart and will. It is a response to a message. Mm. It is a response to the gospel. And therefore, in Romans 10, Paul makes it quite clear. How shall they hear without a preacher? How will they believe if they don't hear? All right. In other words, New Testament <laughs> faith is not uh, an instinctive trust without content. It is the response to a message. And therefore, how can a baby believe without hearing? It's impossible. Right. And of course, that will have an effect on our evangelism. Yeah. So you need to hear to believe. And, uh, and I want to talk about this evangelism. Yeah. But before that, there's one more thing. We were talking about a lot about the, the Holy Spirit, the receiving on the Holy Spirit, the baptism of yes. the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I've heard many people um, say that when we are baptized, we are also being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that the, doesn't Bible link uh, baptism and Holy Spirit and receiving of the Holy Spirit? You know, in all these attempts to uh, justify baby baptism from Scripture, two things that are distinctly different are being confused. Circumcision and baptism are being confused. Babies and children are being confused. Mm. Households and families are being confused. <laughs> and now this confusion is a very common one, and it is to believe that baptism in water and baptism in the Spirit are one and the same thing. They are quite different things in the New Testament. They never happen at the same moment. They either happen near together or even far apart. And one can happen before the other or the other before the one. But they are always distinct. It was for Jesus himself. He went down into the Jordan uh, and was baptized in water. And then it says, he came up out of the water mm. and prayed. Mm. And the Holy Spirit came like a dove on him. And in every other case, baptism in water and baptism in the Holy Spirit are quite different distinct things. They may happen quite close together, yeah. one after the other or one before the other, or they may happen months apart. In Acts 8, the people of Samaria repented, believed, were baptized in water and rejoiced, and the whole city was full of joy. <laughs> a modern evangelist would be thrilled a bit and say, my work is finished. <laughs> they didn't in those days. Mm. The apostles came rushing down from Jerusalem because none of them had received the Holy Spirit. Yeah. There was quite a gap between. Same thing happened in Ephesus in Acts 19. They'd been baptized in water. Though Paul found they'd only been baptized in John's water, as it were, and not in the name of Jesus. So he then baptized them in the name of Jesus. And then he laid hands on them and prayed, and the Holy Spirit came on them. Mm -hmm. So here are two baptisms that every Christian needs. Yes. One in water, one in spirit. Okay. I believe John 3, 5 refers to these two baptisms. Unless a man is born, this is a literal translation, unless a man is born again out of water, the word out is rarely quoted, mm -hmm. and out of spirit, well, to be born out of water and out of spirit, you need to be plunged into water and into spirit. Mm. And it seems to me that we have here, do you know from the very beginning of the Gospels, all four Gospels distinguish between baptism in water and baptism in the spirit. All four Gospels say, quote John as saying, I'll baptize you in water, mm. but there's somebody coming after me who'll baptize you in the spirit. Mm. And in fact, a human being can baptize me in water, mm. but only Jesus himself can baptize me in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so I have to go to two different people for the two things. <laughs> so it's there in the very beginning of each gospel, John said, I can only baptize you in water, mm. but you'll need something more than that. And one of the reasons why he said it is this, baptism in water essentially deals with your past. Mm. It doesn't change your future. It washes away the past, it buries the past, it gives you a clean start, 
And there's another scripture, 1 Peter 3, where Peter says, baptism now saves you, not by washing dirt from your body. So it means through actual physical wash. You, do you think that means that? Yes, he's talking about baptism in water. Okay. And yes, he says, yes. baptism mm -hmm. now saves you, yeah. not by washing dirt from your body, okay. but by an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Mm. In other words, God wants us to start the Christian life clean, okay. with a clean conscience, nothing on our conscience. And he does that in baptism. So while the body is immersed in water, God's washing the inside yeah. and cleansing us uh, so there we are. Now, how did I get yeah. onto that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good that you mentioned that. I want to know, go, now go on to a uh, subject like evangelism. Yeah. And, but when I think about evangelism, I of course think about the Great Commission. And when I think about Great Commission, I suddenly think, didn't that say that, uh, gee, well, weren't the disciples commanded to baptize first and then teach? Isn't that an uh, 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 um, example of, of Jesus basically giving a possibility of baptizing infants before and te teaching them later. Well then let's look a bit more closely. It, shortly did, just... it didn't say baptize them and preach. That's right. And there's a big difference between preaching and <laughs> teaching in the New Testament. Preaching is sharing the gospel. Mm. Teaching is helping people to live the Christian life. Mm. And it, it doesn't say baptizing them and then preaching the gospel to them. It says baptizing them and teaching them how to do all the things I've told you. Because after baptism we need instruction in how to live the Christian life. Mm. That's not about preaching the gospel. Take Mark's gospel at the end, preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mm. That's the order. The mm. preaching comes before <coughs> baptism, the teaching comes after. Right. And teaching is not preaching. Mm. Uh, but yes, now how did we get on to that? <laughs> uh, well, evangelism. It's evangelism. So right, well, let's what talk are about the that. effects of this teaching of yours and also the infant baptism? What are the effects of all this in evangelism? Well, the first thing I want to say is that baptism has been shifted from a context of evangelism which it has in the New Testament, mm. to the cons context of church membership. Okay. And it is seen today not so much as uh, a response to the gospel, mm. as an admission to the church. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Um, in the New Testament, its context is evangelism. Now it's become a church me membership issue. Okay. Now, I believe we need to put it back into evangelism. Okay. First, for the very simple reason that this is the Bible way of accepting the gospel. Mm. And since we've moved it into church membership, we're left with a, a vacuum in evangelism. What do we tell people to do? <laughs> you see, And we've thought up a host of things, <laughs> most of yeah. which only began in America in 19th century revivalism, like put your hand up, yeah. come to the front, sign a decision card. None of these things you find in the New Testament. They are all substitutes for baptism. In the New Testament, when you preach the gospel, as Peter did on the day of Pentecost, and people say, what, what must we do about it? Mm. He said, repent and be baptized. <laughs> I long to hear a modern evangelist quote that verse, mm. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. That was the appeal. Mm. And it was a very definite appeal. They knew exactly what they had to do. And notice that they had to prove repentance before they could be baptized. Oh. You know. People think repentance is just saying sorry. You know the sinner's prayer, Lord, I'm sorry for all my sins. That's not repentance. Mm. Nothing like repentance. And repentance, here's a verse that I've never heard anyone preach on. It's a verse that begins, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now I'm sure you've heard <laughs> that verse. Yes. 
every preacher's used it, none of them quote the whole thing. <laughs> Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, so I did what? No, I, I shouldn't test you. I've yet to meet a Christian who can tell me the rest of the verse. <laughs> he says, so I preach repentance to the Gentiles that they should turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That's right. And somebody's going to say that's salvation by works. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing of the kind. Yeah. Prove their repentance by their deeds. Yes. In other words, I tell people, I don't baptize someone now on profession of faith, but on proof of repentance. And this is a shock to many people. Mm. They've never had to prove their re repentance by their deeds. But you see, an evangelism that said that would be totally different. But that verse, Acts 2, 38 and 39, I have never heard an evangelist use, mm. never. Mm. And yet that's what the apostles said. Yeah. We call it the Peter package. <laughs> and a few evangelists, I, I do know actually, are now using the Peter package. Yeah. And uh, are saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. That is the biblical way of responding to the gospel when you hear it. And we think up so many other different ways because we've moved baptism to church membership, mm. out of evangelism. Mm. But we should, we should follow Jesus' orders. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and then teaching them how to do all that I've told you. Yes. See? But there's another way in which it's affecting evangelism. Yes. When you're trying to evangelize in a, a nation that has had a state church mm. in which everybody's been baptized as babies, mm. you really are up against something. Because you're up against the feeling, oh, but I was baptized as a baby. I'm all right. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I'm part of the church. How dare you come and tell me I'm a sinner and need salvation? There is an inbuilt immunization against the gospel. Mm. And it really is difficult. It's easier in a completely pagan situation because they know they're not Christians. They know they're sinners. They know they're bad. Yeah. So it does make evangelism very, very difficult. And indeed, it makes it a bit of a contradiction. Mm. You're, you're telling people, well, that they're not what they thought they were. Mm. You're, you're saying you're not Christians yet. Yes. So accept Christ. Yes but I am a Christian, I've been baptized. Well, I think we must move on. Yes, well, do you think that a person who's not baptized as a believer is missing something? Yes. <laughs> I know many Christians who don't take the Lord's Supper. They don't eat bread and drink wine, as Jesus told us to, mm -hmm. mainly in the Salvation Army. Yes. But there are other Christians I know who never take that. Yes. And if someone asks me, are they missing something? Yeah. I'd say, of course they are. Jesus would not command us to do something that is unnecessary. Yeah. And it was he who commanded us to take bread and wine. And it was he who commanded us to be immersed in water. Mm. I cannot think that Jesus was just doing it as a kind of uh, optional extra. Mm. When Jesus tells me to do something, I do it. And if I don't do it, I'm going to miss something. Now, I think what may be behind the question is people then say, are you telling me I won't go to heaven unless I yes. am baptized? Yes. Are you telling me I can't be saved without baptism? Mm. You see, the trouble is when people think of the word saved, they immediately think of the next life, heaven and hell. Mm. Jesus didn't come to save us from hell. Mm. That's a bonus thrown in. <laughs> It says, you call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Mm. Unfortunately, most people want to be saved from hell, okay. not their sins. Mm. But baptism is to help us to be saved from our sins yes. by giving us a clean conscience to begin with. And uh, if people want to be saved from their sins, all of them, then they need baptism. 
But you see, when it's twisted to say, do you mean I won't go to heaven until I'm baptized? You, you've put the question into the wrong context. Mm. But yes. Okay. Well, we've talked about doctrinal issues. We've talked yeah. about churches. We've talked about different rites and things. Uh, but what does all this have to do with Jesus? Can you finish with this question? Well, we wouldn't even discuss it if it wasn't for Jesus. Mm. It was Jesus who commanded it. And he not only gave us a command to do it, and if I claim to be a follower of Jesus and don't do what he commands, mm. I'm a living contradiction. Mm. But he also gave us an example. And the one person who didn't need to be baptized was Jesus. The one person who didn't need to be cleaned up was Jesus. And John the Baptist said to his cousin Jesus, you coming to me for baptism? I should be baptizing you. Which says that the man who baptized Jesus himself had not been baptized himself. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes. Because it's not the person who baptizes you that matters, it's the baptism. Mm. But for Jesus, it was not a cleansing. Mm. What was it? He said, it is right for us to do what is right. Mm. And therefore he gave us an example. And if anybody who claims to follow Jesus says, I don't need it, I just don't know how they can say that. If he needed it to do what was right, Boy, I do too. And I've followed Jesus and been baptized in the way that I believe he intended, mm. as clearly taught in the New Testament. Thank you so much, Mr. Porson. I think those words were a good way to, to finish the discussion. Yeah. I, I'm, I believe your thorough teaching has been very helpful for many. I hope so, so. Thank you so much for being with us and, and being here in Finland as a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you.